the connection that you had, you know, with other people, the laughter, the joy, right? You know, I think we scared away Lucy, though, because she was part of the membership class. But the, the fellowship was a very big part, you know, when we got together of the membership class. And that's the reward. That's um, what we long for in our hearts. The fellowship, the connection, the community, right? Because I know you guys, some of you guys are lonely. You want friends. You, know? you want to connect with other people. And that's what I'm going to talk to you guys today about. And I want to share one verse from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. If you guys didn't know that was in the Bible, Ecclesiastes. It's a, um, a wisdom. It's a wisdom book, uh, supposedly written by Solomon. But uh, this is what it says. And he says, Two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And it's talking about the wisdom of having more than one. The strength, the necessity of having a fellowship around you, right? Like the fellowship of the rings. You couldn't just have the humans. You needed the dwarf. You needed the hobbits. You needed the elves. You need a, a team, right? The word fellowship, you probably, some of you only heard it from the, the movie. The fellowship, I don't know what that means. It's not that ring, right? <laughs> you just not that. So, yeah. Th this passage talks about the wisdom, the necessity, and the strength of having others around you. To having a team instead of one man. Having an army instead of being one king. The fact is, we were, we were designed, we were created to have community. To not live our life alone. We were created that way. If you look in the book of Genesis, you will find that the only adjustment God made in his creative order was that he included community. He looked at man, he was alone. And he said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. That was the only adjustment God made in the whole creation. He saw a man who was alone. It's not good. I need to make community. He's not to live his life alone. He needs to learn to love. He needs to be loved. He needs to be encouraged. He needs to encourage. There shall be a community. So, we were designed not to go alone. Yet, today, despite all these activities we're involved in, all these groups that we go to, people often feel alone. They feel as though they're going about life by themselves. They're trying to handle it by themselves. There's a sense of loneliness. And one commentator once said that, you know, we have so much money. We can buy any activity. We could buy a ticket to the basketball game, hockey game. We could buy a Nintendo Wii or whatever. You know, we did have a good time at... Um, at Ched's house, he has the, 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 the Xbox, the motion thingy. And I was like, I know what Ched does in his free time now. You know, all that dancing and stuff. We could buy so much activity, yet in America, I'm talking about, you know, U.S. and Canada as a whole, it's one of the loneliest places. The people here, they, they're isolated. They're isolated. And... It's as if, with all these activities, um, people are like hamster on wheels. You know? They're continuing to pedal on the wheel, they're just going around and around, living. And yet, at the end of the day, they're just going around in circles, and there's no meaning to the motion. It's a motion without depth, and motion without meaning. And John Locke, 
he's the chairman of the Department of Human Communication Sciences at the University of Sheffield in England, he writes that there is a, a sense of social need, a social dysfunction um, in contemporary society today. And he writes about it in the book, it's titled The Devoicing of Society. Why we don't talk to each other anymore. That's the name of the title of the book. And he attributes the people drifting away from each other to individualism. It's a culture. And, and um, individualism is a way of life that makes the individual supreme or sovereign over everything else. And for those um, who were born into this culture, I wasn't born into this Western individualistic culture. By the way, the word individualism was created after, you know, it's a, it's a 19th and 20th century created word. There was no word individualism before the 19th century, which means everybody belonged to a certain group, everybody belonged to uh, a, a community. It's only in this, it's a new modern phenomenon, cultural phenomenon, individualism and individualistic tendencies. But when you're born into it, you don't realize you're individualistic, that you think, you know, what's my need? You know, what do I want? You know, first, you know, that's the first question we ask before we make a decision. And we don't know we have this individualistic tendency which keeps us from experiencing authentic community, which we need. And I found out about um, this Western individualistic uh, cultural tendency in me when I went to Korea. Um, when I was 30 years old, I decided to go to Korea to work. And as I worked there, I began to um, realize um, this, this cultural uh, uh, characteristic. And, and what had happened was, uh, at the job, every during lunchtime, it was so strange to me. Everybody knew where they were supposed to eat. I mean, they decided where they were going to eat together as a whole. I'm talking about like ten people. They're like, oh yeah, let's go there, and everyone would just agree, yeah. And it was just assume that you just follow along, but not me. I'm like, um, actually, I want. I'm, I'm, today, I'm going to go to keep up to you. You know, um, today, um, actually, I want, <laughs> I don't want to eat that today. You know, I'm like, and they just give me this weird look, like, say, what? <laughs> Where are you from? Venus? Mars? Oh, you're from America, right? Kind of like, you're weird. We don't do that here. We don't act alone. But for me, it was just a, it's just a natural thing. Hey, shouldn't we think about what we want? You know, what, what I want? Can I just go where I want to eat? It don't work that way in Korea. It's, you work together. So there is a culture that's collective. And you think about the group first instead of your own. And sometimes that value, the value of the group is so strong that it overrides um, your own needs, your individual needs. And I'm not talking about like, you know, yeah, of course, when your kid is sick and you gotta go, you go, and you're like, oh, you're eating there? Uh, I should follow you. No, not like that. But there's, and, and so, when we are born into this uh, me culture, we don't know the impact this mindset has in us trying to achieve community and a sense of belonging. Because our, our culture moves us away from that. You see? And even in the church, individualism, we can see individualism in the church. For example, um, in, even in small groups, right? It's designed to build community. Right? The small groups. It's, it's, it's designed to build community. Although the first uh, marriage couple small group we started wasn't small at all. <laughs> it was huge. It was like a little clan. It was a village thing. But the small group is designed to build community, but it doesn't work in the church. Because each member comes in with an individualist attitude. What am I going to get out of this? 
bring your opinions. And uh, in Princeton, Robert Withnow, he's a cultural uh, specialist, he's found that these small groups, quote, mainly provide occasions for individuals to focus on themselves in the presence of others. And this is a significant thing because in the church and in faith, fellowship is very important in the life of the church and of your faith. In fact, the passage today shows that fellowship, I'm talking about connecting with other beliefs, connecting with people, spending time with them, getting to know them, it's the key to maintaining your faith in Christ. It's the key. You cannot go alone. And you were meant to go alone. God didn't design it that way. Now, fellowship um, in Greek it means it's koinonia. And there are three aspects to it. Okay? Three definitions. Koinonia. Anyone ever hear about it? Ever read Greek? Okay. Don't worry. So there are three aspects. Number one is contact. There needs to be certain contact for a fellowship to happen between people. Next is participation. There needs to be some sort of, you know, you're participating in something. And next is contribution. So it's it's you're interacting with people in a committed in an intimate way. And it is one of four things that the first Christians devoted themselves to, which made the church grow. You know, the first church, the first Christians, they devoted themselves to four things. One, teaching. The second, fellowship. Third, breaking of bread. And fourth, prayer. Okay? So those cover basically discipleship, fellowship, worship, right? And so, but it was one of four things that the church, they devoted themselves, they, devoted, they continually had this contact, participate, contribute. Okay? A lot of times in churches today, we have contact and, and we do have some participation, but the contribution to may be lacking. But it's one of four things that people devoted and, and, and people began to gather around this new community, okay? So it was uh, part of the ingredient that made the church grow, not only grow, but explode. Explode, right? And what is it about fellowship, what is it about people that makes, that attracts people and makes the community grow? It's because people bring people to God. You're a person, correct? You are created to bring people to God. God uses people to bring people to himself. It doesn't happen like, I want you to go to church now, whoever you are, <laughs> you know? And then, voila, I just show up. People bring people to God. Karen, you know, Connie, father-daughter relationship, friend relationship, everybody here has come to know God through a connection with a person. Not only do people bring people to God, people help people to grow in faith as well. So we cannot come to Christ alone. We cannot grow in our faith alone, apart from fellowship of other Christians. Fellowship is very important. Now, I told you guys about um, Lee Strobel. He's the one who wrote the case uh, for Christ, if you have not read that book, please read it. It will encourage you so much in your faith. As I said before,
before he, he was a reporter. In fact, he, uh, he was a reporter and investigator to criminal, uh, to criminal acts. And he followed lawyers, prosecute, uh, uh, prosecuting lawyers. Um, and, and, and anyways, he, he wanted to investigate the validity of Christianity. And for one and a half years, he did that. And he came to a conclusion that it would take more faith for him to reject Christianity. It would take more faith. With all the evidence that he has accumulated, he interviewed all the, um, the scholars and the leading authorities in diff you know, different areas. It would take more uh, faith for him to reject Christianity than to accept it. I mean, he was put into a position where he was like, okay, I mean, I believe. But not only did he believe, he received and he became a follower of Christ. Now, two months after he committed himself to Christ, this is what I want to share. Two months after he accepted Christ as his Savior and Lord, he surrendered his life. He turned from his, you know, he repented of his sinful ways. He talked about being a drunkard. He talked about, you know, not being at home, how profane he was, living an immoral life, etc., etc. He said, you know, he repented of that. But two months after he accepted Christ as Savior, his five-year-old daughter, Allison, said to her mom, as Lee writes in his book, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he has done for Daddy. Five-year-old girl, after two months, says, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he has done for daddy. And Lee writes, here was a little girl who had only known a father who was profane, angry, verbally harsh, and all too often absent. And even though she had never interviewed a scholar, never analyzed the data, never investigated historical evidence, she had seen up close the influence that Jesus could have on one person's life. How was this five-year-old affected through a person? How did she come to know that God had transforming power through a person? Fellowship is a people thing. We need it in order for us to grow in our faith in order for us to help others to grow in our faith. People changes people. We cannot change on our own. We can't use self-help books. And that's the reason for the incarnation. People can only be changed by people. That's why Jesus came to us as a person. He didn't just send us a book, right? Jesus came to us as a human to affect humans and to redeem us, to transform us, to change us. And it's happening all over the world. And so, you are not meant to go on this journey of faith alone. And you cannot. Fellowship is the key to growing in our faith with God and coming to know Him. But how does that happen? As I mentioned earlier, it's not just about gathering together, just talking about how our day was, chit-chatting over, um, you know, just the mundane affairs. There's a purpose to the fellowship. How does this happen? How does this getting together, meeting with other Christians, grow us and make us better? When we look in the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse uh, 24, says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love 
and good deeds. And what the writer is saying is, you know the faith that you have as a Christian? Keep it, but let's, we need to go together. Okay, we can't do it alone. Here it says, let us consider how we may um, spur one another. Actually, the, the Greek word order is, let us consider one another. That's the Greek word order. Okay? Kai kata no amen aleilus. And let us observe one another. So how does fellowship bring about change? It's not going into it with the... We have to be aware of our individualistic tendencies. We have to get rid of that. And say, we have to become observers. We have to observe one another. We have to um, put our focus and interest in getting to know others. Focus on others. Be, listen. Listen. To what people are going through. Observe what they're going through. Actually, um, on the surface, people are very good observers. Um, you know, just last week, I was just going through really rough times. It's just it's a rough week. Okay, Awana is starting, and that's taking up a lot of time. You know, preparing for that, and then you know, preparing for EM. So it's going through rough. Just tired, you know, and. Um, you know, people will just come up to you, wow, Pastor Jane, you look tired. I'm like, I am. <laughs> and then that's it. <laughs> they just walk away. <laughs> that happened twice. Man, you look tired. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> I am. <laughs> they just walk away. People are very observant. <laughs> but that's it. You know, man, you look awful. Oh, thank you <laughs> for noticing. You know, and they don't go further. Here he says, let us observe how we may spur toward love and good deeds. The goal is love and good deeds. We don't just go into the fellowship and observe. But that's a big part, I think, for us to observe first, you know, because that takes us away from our individualistic tendencies and begin to focus on other people. Like, hey, you know, you look awful, but why? <laughs> you know? But why? You know? How can I help? How can I encourage you to love? You know? And a couple of examples that I want to give you of this is one I already mentioned before in the book, Just Walk Across the Room, right? Um, I talk about how this um, Afri African-American Muslim man was always left out in social gatherings. He was always left in the corner, right? No one went to talk to him because he was formidable, right? This big... You know, African man, he's, you know, he looks Muslim. You're like, I ain't talking no Muslim. And no one's going to talk to him. But then he said, one day, you know, um, a Christian man walked up to him, introduced himself, said, hey, how you doing? What's your name? Let me get to know you. He didn't just notice a person in need and by himself. He did something about it. He walked across the room. Right? That's kind of ironic. Only thing you have to do is walk across the room. But at the same time, you have to walk across the room, right? It's simple and yet not so simple. He did something about it. He actually walked and he he he, he approached him. He's like, "Hey, you know what's going on? You know what's your name?" And the end result is that that Muslim man became a Christian in the end, didn't he? Um, another example, I think I um, showed you guys or, or, or told you guys before, but maybe not as in detail was. Uh, there was a lady who was a very good talent. She was talented in writing, and she found that uh, she really enjoyed writing in college, so she sent one of her articles to be published at a magazine, which was turned down and rejected. And um, she lost the courage. She lost the courage to pursue her writing career. But one day, her husband, paying a little bit more attention, paying a little bit more attention to uh, her wife, began to read her writings. And he's like, this is good. And he went to her and said, um, I want to interrupt your reading, but you know what? This stuff is good. You, know, you should really send it in for publishing. And he encouraged her. He didn't just notice, like, oh, this is good. All right? It's good. He went 
to her, encouraged her to do good works, to pursue her talent in her career, right? And that encouraged her, and um, she stopped reading. For 30 minutes, she just dreamt about her writing, how her writing can affect people. And she sent in her article, her essay, and it was accepted by the magazine. And afterwards, many of her writings have been published in magazines, and uh, she has a, a, a contract with them. She has a book contract now, right? Because her husband was willing. Not only did he notice something about her, she did something about it, and she encouraged her. The purpose of fellowship is to encourage, to spur on another person to do good works and to love, to encourage someone. It is the purpose for us to have fellowship, to get together, not to voice our own opinions, right? And the word encourage means to inspire courage. A lot of us have potential for good works. A lot of us, we, we don't even see right now, have in your heart you have dreams. In your heart you, you have fears. And we lack the courage to tap into our full potential. And we need someone to come in and say, hey, I see this in you. Keep going. You know, I see this in you. We need someone to inspire courage so that we can continue on. So the purpose of the fellowship is to encourage one another. See? And so the first thing we need to learn to do is to be observant of other people. Okay? Focus on learning the interests and to see the world from other people's perspective. And in order to do this, we need to set aside time to meet and to share. That's what fellowship is. It's, it, you're just setting aside a time, okay, to meet with other people, to, to encourage them. You know, and God has given each of you a uniqueness, your life background, and talents and experience. Not just for yourself, but for you to share with others so that you could be an encouragement to others. God's given you this, this gift of your life and experience to share with others. It's God's gift. And God wants you to go into a fellowship and to encourage other people and to share so that other people, through your encouragement and through through your influence, they will become better. And isn't that what Christ did? Isn't that what Christ, when he came to be an example, right? Sacrificing his life. And I'm doing this for you, right? He said, you know, do this in remembrance of me when he broke the bread, right? And he passed out the cup. This is the blood pour out for you. Do this in remembrance, remembrance of me. Isn't this what Christ did for us as an example to inspire? And if we're Christians, if we have accepted Christ, you know, we are to do the same thing. We are to go and to inspire people, to help people with the gift and the talents that he has uh, given you. Fellowship. But we need to set aside time and share life because people are not going to share their needs, you know, casually, on the go. First, it takes I mean, to share something deep that we're struggling with or our dreams. It, it takes time to explain. It's not like you could do over, you know, snacks, right? On the go. It's like, hey, you know, oh, by the way, Jesus, I mean, I'm struggling with this. You know, you just don't do that. You don't have time to talk about it. You don't have time to converse and discuss and exchange ideas and share your experiences. And when the experiences of me, you know, when, when somebody... Uh, shares an experience that you have experienced, right? And there's a sense of uh, encouragement in that. So we need to set aside time to have fellowship. And, um, and so the church, you know, our, our 
English ministry. We cannot grow without um, setting aside time for fellowship. And the, the um, membership class, you know, half of it is, is fellowship, okay? Half of it is for you to just come and meet people to be encouraged. And for you to encourage others by sharing your life, sharing your experiences, sharing your struggles, to not keep your struggles to yourself, to not keep your questions to yourself, but to share it, let it out, and in community, you solve it together. And that's what this passage is talking about. Let us observe one another. Let's go together in this toward love and good works. And what does he say next? Let us not do this. And what is that? Neglect gathering together. As some are, some are in the habit of doing. Let's, let us not neglect gathering together. As some are in the habit. So, you know, every time, you know, when I see uh, you come consistently, even, even to this group, and even to this worship, you know, I'm like, way to go. You know, good job. Step number one. Let's go to step number two, right? Let us not neglect the gathering because it's so important, right? And the church and, and, and uh, the, the, our Christian uh, fellowship, in order for it to have meaning in our life, it cannot be just another spoke in a wheel. Okay? The reason why we have so many activities in our life and yet have a sense of dissatisfaction in terms of intimacy and depth is because we're not focusing on the right thing. We don't have enough energy or time to focus on all these different activities and find meaning. We're just like hamsters. Too much, too many motion, no meaning. What we need to do is prioritize and consolidate our activities. You have to consolidate your activity. For the early church, fellowship was not just another activity in life. Just go there, okay, great. It was central to their life. It was their hub. The, the, the church life was their life. And you know what Jesus said? Unless we as a church, and I'm not, I don't expect every single person, actually I do expect, you know, but I want and hope and pray that every single person here become fully committed to, the, to, to our English ministry, not to the English ministry, but to Christ fellowship, right? When, when there's a commitment, that's when it's going to grow. In the early church, Acts chapter 2 says they continually committed themselves. They continually. Jesus said, unless you denounce everything, you cannot be my disciple. What he's saying is, I'm the most important person in your life. Trust in me. Don't trust in anything else. Make, I'm the son of God. I created you. I know what you're going through. Don't trust in other things. Trust in me. Make me first, and I'll take care of you. That's what the early church did. Why? Because they saw the resurrected Christ. They saw the resurrected Christ. And so, for, for, for some of us who have experienced Christ, the 
Is it Christ in our life? We need to step up our game. And make our church life and the fellowship a priority. A priority? Because not only does your faith depend on it, the faith of your brothers and sisters here who are sitting, they depend on it. They depend on you. They depend on your experience. They depend on your faith in Christ to grow them. So you need to go and join the fellowship. You need to be there for them, for your brothers and sisters in Christ because you have seen the resurrected Christ. If you have not seen the resurrected Christ, then, you know, there's no expectation. Of course. What can you give? But for those who have experienced the resurrected Christ, there's no death. No more death. There's so much hope in that that you could, there's so much to give. It takes commitment for you need to make time. You need to make it a priority. A fellowship of other believers. God will take care of the rest. God will take care of the rest. Okay? Lastly, we need to have fellowship because People matter to God. People matter. You matter to God. And God designed the fellowship of believers. God designed people meeting people to help you. That's God's design. You matter to God, and people matter to God. That's why you need to meet. This is just an introduction to a series that I'm going to talk about in terms of the importance of, of the people of God coming together. Okay? Next week, I'm going to talk about the church as a family. Okay? And um, I have a, a creed that, that I'm working with for our English ministry, and I've shared it with some of you. But the first aspect of that creed is the importance of fellowship and family. If you want change in your life, you want more intimacy with God, you want growth in your faith, there has to be something different if you want something different. And the difference that I'm telling you, you have to set aside time and make fellowship a priority. You gotta meet other Christians. I mean, quality time. I'm not, I'm not talking about just coming here and just listening to sermons. Although that's good, especially when I'm preaching, you know what I'm saying? No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Probably especially when I'm, when I'm not preaching is better. But there's gotta be change, and one of those changes is time with other Christians, quality time, fellowship. Would you make fellowship a priority in your life? Amen. For you to help others grow and for others to help you grow in your faith so that together as a community we can grow in Christ likeness. Amen. Dear God, I pray that you would give us faith and uh,